Hi, everyone. I hope you all had a nice holiday break. And for those of you who are struggling in areas with the high COVID rates right now, that you're able to stay safe. This Saturday morning, January 22nd, we have a live webinar and panel, Edith Rockefeller McCormick, philanthropist, intellectual, and analyst, who is the first Jungian analyst in Chicago, with Andrea Frederici Ross, author of Edith, the rogue Rockefeller McCormick, and Kenan McKee, Jungian analyst, and Victoria Drake, PhD. So there will be a presentation and a live panel discussion. On Friday, February 4th, we have The Magic of Dreams, a practical study of the transcendent function with Warren Sibilla Jr., Jungian analyst, who is the current director of training in the analyst training program here at the Institute. It's at 1 to 4 p.m. Chicago time via Zoom. So if you're interested in either of those webinars, just go to youngchicago.org for more information and to register. Thanks. Welcome to the Jung Anthology Podcast from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. This month, we are unlocking a recent webinar from our archives, Jung and the Environment, with Dennis Merritt, PhD, LCSW, and Jungian analyst. Many believe we are in the Anthropocene era, an era marked by the planet-wide influence of our species. The field of eco-psychology emerged in the early 1900s as a belated response from the psychological community to address the cascading effects of human-created environmental damage. Jungian eco-psychology offers one of the best frameworks for analyzing our dysfunctional relationship with the environment and with each other through an archetypal analysis of the layers of the collective unconscious. This webinar is uh, available here You'll have the audio format and the video will be available on YouTube by a link in the description. So if you prefer to watch rather than listen, uh, you can just click on the link in the description to go to the video. But we're also sharing it as an audio version. We're making this available at Dennis's request because to him it's important that it have a wide listenership and not be reserved just for um, people who are willing to pay for the video. So if you have paid for uh, the video, just send me an email at young at youngchicago.org and I'd be happy to give you a store credit for the purchase since we are making this video free. So now let's get to the webinar. I am uh, Arlo Compan and I'm a chair with Debbie Stutzman, co-chairs with the Public Program Committee. Dennis grew up on a small dairy farm in Wisconsin, and there he established a very deep connection with the land. He obtained a PhD from, the, I think it's University of California at Berkeley um, in insect pathology, microbial control of insect, insect pests, before he did his training at the C.G. Jung Institute of Zurich. In 1991 and 92, he and his wife conducted week-long programs, which uh, they entitled Spirit in the Land, Spirit in Animals, and Spirit in People. In those programs, they brought together Jungian psychology, science, and Native American spirituality in an experiential and didactic manner. Those talks, he gave were the genesis of the four volumes of his current most recent publication, uh, The Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe, Jung, Hermes, and Eco-Psychology. Since 2009, Dennis has been focusing on climate change and the degradation of the environment from a Jungian perspective. Dr. Merritt practices in Milwaukee and is a senior member of the Chicago Jung Institute. He also has a blog, if you're interested, 
It's entitled UnionEchoPsychology.com. And there he has a variety of articles. They are Hunger Games from a Union political and environmental perspective, another one on guns and the American psyche, and a third on George Fly Floyd and COVID-19, inflection points in the Anthropocene era. Please welcome Dennis Merritt. Thank you, Arlo. Uh, I actually welcome the opportunity to speak about the environmental issues. I've been an environmentalist at least since the eighth grade, and things haven't gotten much better since then. Um, I had a, a science teacher, a great science teacher in um, high school and a deep environmentalist, and he has strongly influenced uh, me for my whole life and my connection with the land. So there's the uh, small dairy farm I grew up on, 25 cows. Uh, this is 25 miles east of Green Bay. Uh, if Wisconsin is like a thumb, Kiwani and the farm is right kind of at the base of that thumb, five miles from Lake Michigan, dead end road there. And uh, in the in eco psychologists talk about the importance of being able to spend extended periods on the land unstructured. And I certainly had plenty of that on the farm when we weren't haying or putting in the oats or something, I spent a lot of time roaming the, around the river and in the woods, uh, collecting insects, song, uh, feathers from birds, uh, wildflowers, and so on. So I had decided to become an entomologist by the eighth grade, but I didn't want to be a spray jockey. The year I graduated from high school, 1962, Rachel Carson's book came out, Silent Spring. Is about the devastating effect of DDT um, in the whole ecosystem. So that's where, uh, here's her book. And I went out to Berkeley in the fall of 1967 to start my graduate work in insect pathology. So you don't have to use chemical pesticides. Uh, and it was an incredible time to be there. 1968 was my first full year. At the end of that year, I was 1A for the draft for the Vietnam War for the third time. And that's when I realized that politics wasn't a game. Between that and the effect of corporate agriculture in California, I realized the importance not only in terms of international politics, but also uh, on the land. So I lived in the uh, church basement, University Lutheran Chapel, which was a Missouri Synod Lutheran church. We set up a free food program I had a room in one end of the basement. This is the kitchen crew at the other end. And uh, we were feeding the street people, the draft dodgers and so on. It was just an amazing time to be there. And as a result of being in Berkeley in the late sixties, I eventually discovered Carl Jung. And within nine months after that, I was applying to train at the Jung Institute in Zurich. So I honestly believe that uh, Jungian eco-psychology, as I've labeled it, is one of the best ways for framing our problems with the environment, analyzing what they are, and then some ideas on how to go forward. And I think uh, I recognize, probably more unconsciously, when I start reading Jung, the real ecological uh, nature of his entire system, and I'll develop some of that today. So a report came out, it hasn't even been published yet. I heard this on uh, NPR. Uh, Caroline Hickman uh, specializes in uh, climate psychology at the University of Bath. And she surveyed 10,000 youth ages 16 to 25 from 10 countries about climate change. And this is pretty disturbing in a way not surprising. So two thirds of them said they were sad, afraid, and anxious about climate change. A half of them felt angry, helpless, and thought the future would be frightening. A half believed that humanity was doomed, and four out of 10 didn't want to bring children into the world. And two thirds felt the government was lying to them about the effectiveness of government actions to combat climate change. 
leaving them feeling sad and betrayed. And the lack of government activity increases their anxiety. And they felt that adults weren't listening to them and they couldn't trust their parents or teachers. And many were wondering, what's the point of going to school if there's no future? This is pretty sad. So my talk today in, in some fundamental ways are addressed toward the young people. I, I, I never forget how I felt in Berkeley when I was 1A for the draft. I knew what was happening in Vietnam with all the teach-ins and so on. And I felt abandoned and betrayed by my parents and my country. And I think the youth of today across the planet have much deeper reasons to feel that way. So there's a conference coming up on the climate in Glasgow, and it's being described as the last chance to avoid disaster. Uh, we have to implicate, Im, imp, implement the international agreements to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 25% um, within the next decade and be carbon neutral by 2050. And the developing countries are already $100 billion short in their pledge commitments to do this. And the United States is not on target to meet our goals uh, for the 2015 Paris Accords to limit uh, the increase in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we're likely to reach that between 2040 and 2050 and two degrees Celsius not long after that. And at two degrees Celsius, agriculture is going to be affected. So we are going to be lucky to hold the, the global warming to 1.75 degrees Celsius. And if we keep going at the present rate, uh, it will increase our temperatures, uh, our global temperatures by five to seven degrees Celsius by 2100, and the sea level will rise by seven to eight feet. So I'm front-loading all the disastrous sounding stuff here. It's always a question in the environmental movement, do you tell people the truth? Is, is it over gonna, going to overwhelm them? And the way I think about it is, uh, and the argument I would be developing today is we have to be thinking in terms of a paradigm shift, major shift for our whole species. And the only thing that may move us in that direction if we start to fully realize the implications of climate change and the disasters that are going be, uh, behind it. There are other problems as well uh, in terms of environmental damage and extinctions. So there's a steep uh, decline in the ocean fish populations in the last 40 years. And by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than there are fish. 1 million species out of the estimated 10 million could be driven to extinction. And part of this talk is uh, uh, dedicated to the insects on the planet. Two thirds of the species are insects. So they are going to be suffering the most in terms of literally billions of years of evolution that's lost. And the extinction rate is 100 times faster uh, since 1500 and the rate is accelerating. It's being called the sixth extinction, the biggest since the dinosaurs uh, were driven extinct 65 million years ago. And as an entomologist, I really have been affected by the fact that several European countries have reported that the insect populations overall are down by 25% and more. And we have to remember that three quarters of the food crops depend on insects for pollination. The Chinese are trying to get ahead of the game by developing uh, mechanical insects to pollinate some of their plants. Uh, we will need twice as much food in the next 30 years to feed the population increase. And already up to 30% of our soils have been degraded. And it is estimated that we have 60 years left for agriculture. One third of the world's coral reefs have been lost in the last three years. 
And we all know about the fire damage that's been happening in California, estimated cost of $24 billion last year. And we're still in the middle of pandemic. It is estimated there will be five new emerging diseases every year, and the world's economic system could be crushed if there's one serious pandemic per decade because humans are encroaching more and more into the natural environment. We are being exposed to the zootic diseases there. And that's how we think the COVID uh, virus uh, came about from the wet markets with the animal sales in uh, China. And 31% of the diseases, like I said, are coming from the land changes. So we are living in what many are calling the Anthropocene era. We are like a cancer on the planet. So if you think of what cancer is in the human body, it's some cells that are growing out of relationship to the other cells. They're not part of any organs. They're not uh, uh, working in an integrated manner for the benefit of the whole. They're sucking up all the resources in the body just to increase those cancer cells. And that's very much the way we humans are. And our laws and our systems are like a virus. But as Richard Reich said, that these laws and systems were created by humans, the economic systems, the educational systems, even uh, in some ways our spiritual systems. And they can be changed, and they will have to be changed. Um, Hermes uh, is the god of advertising. He's the trickster. Think of any drug commercial. How can the drug companies spend billions of dollars advertising a drug when they got to tell you the side effects could be that you're going to feel suicidal, could damage your liver, be more vulnerable to tuberculosis, and so on? That's Hermes the trickster. Just examine how they do that next time you see a drug commercial on TV. So Hermes uh, is driving our consumer culture and is trying to convince us that we can buy happiness. Whereas what we really need, instead of more products, are more time with the family, self-development, community involvement, and so on. And I will develop this later on about the Corporations are like the modern day monsters and dragons, as Jung would have called them. So we are moving toward literalizing the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, as presented in the um, book of Revelations. And that is disease, war, pestilence, and famine. Even the military recognizes that climate change is a conflict amplifier. So this is the version at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in uh, Cleveland, where I did an eco-psychology workshop a few years ago. I think that's Jerry Garcia from the Grateful Dead and probably Woody Guthrie there. So we owe it to the younger generation to change our ways. I see Greta uh, Thunberg as the face for the younger generation and their concerns about climate change and environmental damage. And here's what she said uh, three days ago. Um, she was addressing a, um, a Youth for Climate Summit, a three-day event in Milan, where 400 environmentalists youth are gathering. And she said, build back better, blah, blah, blah. Green economy, blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear from our so-called leaders, words. Words that sound great, but so far have led to no action. Our hopes and dreams drowned in empty words. We've had 30 years of blah, blah, blah. And where has that led us, she asked. Thunberg catalyzed uh, the failure of the world leaders to change direction on climate change as an international betrayal. And then she pleaded for drastic uh, reductions in 
carbon dioxide emissions like unlike anything the world has any ever seen. Hope is not blah, 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 she said. Hope is telling the truth. Hope is taking actions. So look into Greta's eyes. What response do you have to her challenges here? What do you have to say to the young people of the world? What will it be like when your children or your grandchildren reach your age? So how do we go about addressing these issues? Well, in the, in the 1990s, a new field of psychology started to emerge called eco-psychology. And Hillman was part of that. He wrote a book, I think it was 1992, um, saying that uh, we've had 100 years of psychotherapy and the world's getting worse. So far, psychotherapy and psychology has been part of the problem and not part of the solution. We continue to act like the world is all about what's in our psyche or human to human interactions as the environment deteriorates. So Hillman has been great for trying to get psychology therapy out of the therapist office and out into the world. And I'll develop that point later on. Uh, Theodore Rozak coined the term eco-psychology in his 1992 book, The Voice of the Earth, no, 1994. And here are some of the uh, premises of eco-psychology. I call it the ecology of psychology and the psychology of ecology, the study of the human relationship with the natural world. And it explores how our attitudes, values, beliefs, perspectives, and actions affect the natural world. And it explores the many dimensions of our dysfunctional relationship with nature. And also, and this is where I'll develop it quite thoroughly later on, how we can deepen our connection with nature from a Jungian perspective. So the help of the planet and the individuals are inextricably linked. A good connection between the two is healing for both. And it's important how we educate about the human nature relationship, which requires an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach. And sustainability at the psychological, social, and environmental levels, that's the goal. And I am a believer with uh, Fisher, one of the big uh, names in eco-psychology, eco-psychology is at the center of a multidisciplinary approach to radically restructure our social, economic, and cultural systems in order to live ecologically and sustainably. I'm positing Jung as the prototypical eco-psychologist because he brings some of the deepest analysis to our environmental problems with an archetypal perspective. Jung was deeply uh, connected to his Swiss land and the beauty and power and mystery of nature. And this is his favorite picture of himself, not lecturing uh, at a psych uh, psychologist conference, but that's probably either the uh, uh, Eatleyberg uh, on the upper lake Zurich or the mountains, uh, the Alps behind him at, in his retreat in Bollingen. And here's some of the things that Jung had to say about nature. He said, natural life is the nurturing, nourishing soul, soil of the soul. That's from the collected works. Nature is not matter only. She is also spirit. Earth has a soul. Do you think that somewhere we are not in nature, that we are different from nature? No, we are in nature and we are exactly like nature. I am fully committed to the idea that human existence should be rooted in earth. 
And Jung said this about uh, the breath of the human psyche. It's a quote from Man and His Symbols. The unconscious must not be ignored. It is as natural, as limitless, and as powerful as the stars. And here's a profound quote from Marie-Louise von Franz, one of Jung's right-hand men, women, if you go, one of the main uh, promoters of what I call a, a traditional view of Jungian psychology. He said, personal injuries did not affect him as much as the suffering in the contemporary world, the devastation of nature, the overpopulation problem, the rape of still flourishing non-Christian cultures by the brutality of modern technology. For Jung, these problems were an agony which kept him constantly and indefatigably on the watch for any possibilities for a healing transformation which might emerge from the depth of the psyche. So Jung, um, Jung's start, if you will, with this connection uh, was by growing up um, in rural Switzerland, started off his life. But when he was four years old, he had this powerful dream, this nightmare, of an underground phallus that was on a golden throne. And he later came to think of that as kind of God's shadow side, God's side that was in the earth. And it really became the foundation eventually for his interest in alchemy, as we'll see later on with what alchemy is all about. So when he was feeling bad and his parents were arguing and whatnot, he would escape into what he called personality number two. And in that realm, he said it was old, skeptical, mistrustful, remote from the world of men, but close to nature, the earth, the sun, the moon, the weather, all living creatures, and above all, close to the night, to dreams, and whatever God worked directly in him. Another quote from that personality number two. This is in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Besides this world, there existed another realm, like a temple in which everyone who entered was transformed and suddenly overpowered by a vision of the whole cosmos so that he could only marvel and admire, forgetful of himself. Here lived the other who knew God as a hidden, personal, and at the same time, suprapersonal secret. Here, nothing separated man from God. Indeed, it was as though the human mind looked down upon creation simultaneously with God. This personality number two, this sense of being in the presence of God and of a sense of the whole cosmos in a sacred way, that persisted with him throughout his adolescence. And it later became when he realized that this was kind of like dissociation. I think it wasn't until he was in college or medical school, they had a dream that helped him realize, no, I can't live in that realm. I've got to be in an I-thou relationship to it. And that realm became his idea of the collective unconscious. So Jung was... Uh, deeply connected in the, to nature. And there are two things that we should examine about that connection. First is he built a retreat on Lower Lake Zurich. He Kusnak, where he lived and where the um, Jung Institute, one of the two Jung Institutes now, actually one of the three, um, is in, uh, in Kusnak, Kusnak or Zurich. So it started off on the left with that tower. And then on the right, he expanded it four times uh, over his life, the last time after his wife and Tony Wolf died. And uh, he would spend extended periods of time there, perhaps up to half of his time um, at uh, Bollingen in his later years. 
when he would get there, he would spend up to three days just clearing his mind, just staring at the water or chopping wood, just doing mundane tasks. And then being there without electricity and running water in a place that was that he designed and helped to build and full of his personal symbolism, he sank deeply into his own unconscious, into what is the collective unconscious for many of us, especially here in the West, and could look far into the, the future. And it's from those depths that much of his writing uh, came, and it was framed and nurtured, if you will, by this connection to the land. The second thing about Jung, important to realize, is that he had a strong identity with Merlin. So um, the myth of Merlin, there are several myths. It's related to the Grail legend, and Jung thought that was one of the most important myths for the West. Uh, the Grail legend uh, emerged around uh, in the 1200s. And one of those virgins, uh, virgins, yeah, uh, versions of the le legend was that the chalice that Jesus uh, served the wine in at the Last Supper um, was used by Joseph of Arimathea to collect the blood when Jesus was speared on the cross. And that chalice uh, somehow or another ended up in the United Kingdom. And that um, uh, the, the chalice and the, the search for that uh, got associated with King Arthur and the legends of the round table. And Merlin was an advisor to King Arthur. And Jung felt that Merlin was really the hero of one of the myths of, uh, of the Arthurian legend uh, of Parsifal. So this is Merlin. He was a druidic shaman. And a very important concept is related to this. Jung's challenge to modern men and women was to unite their cultured side with what he liked to call the two million year old man within what my dear friend, the late Fred Gustafson said, the indigenous one within. And Jung said that one of the challenges that Christianity had to deal with was to come to terms with the so-called paganism and heathenism that they had been persecuting for centuries. They had to integrate that knowledge and that connection to the land and the sacred connection of, to the land like indigenous people had and Merlin was Jung's archetypal image for that, if you will. Um, and Merlin, Jung felt, was the, uh, the secret of alchemy, and alchemy became his symbolic system. Now, one of the ways Jung thought of Merlin was that uh, there was uh, some of the myths were that Merlin got so fed up with humans, he escaped into the woods. And you could occasionally hear the cry of Merlin at night from the winds. And Jung said, when Merlin disappears, he goes to Bollingen. So that was one of many ways where Jung felt this profound connection with him. Jung said that Merlin represents the actual, actual solution to the problem of opposites and is an important aspect of the new age that we'll look at later on. So what was alchemy? Alchemy uh, is associated uh, with early Christianity all the way up to the uh, 1600s and the beginning of modern science. So the alchemists were there are many descriptions of what they were trying to do to transmute lead into gold and so on. Jungians have worked this out um, metaphorically very thoroughly. But Jung saw them as projecting the post-Christian unconscious into the alchemical vessels and retorts. So the things that Christianity had suppressed or repressed or denigrated, the body, the feminine, sexuality, sensuality, nature, 
That's what the alchemists were working. They were working in secret because the church would not have approved of what they were doing. And they saw couples having intercourse and all sorts of things going on there. And the power of what they were dealing with was the power of the collective unconscious. Um, and the alchemists uh, were, they thought that Jesus had saved the microcosm, the human psyche, psyche but they were trying to re-sanctify the macrocosm, nature, that Christianity had kind of removed itself from. So this is a painting by one of Jung's favorite painters, Peter Berkhauser. And there's a wonderful book uh, that she did with commentary in German and English. And this is a painting called The Observer. And I chose it because to me, it's some haunting illustration of the power of the unconscious. And it says, before we know ourselves, we are already known. The self watches us like a superior observer, a private protection, intimate understanding as an individual judge, and an inexorable witness, allowing no self-deception. It is both subhuman and superhuman and sees things far beyond our conscious time. And another image from that book called Spiritus and Amalus. What appears in man to be only wild instinct has in fact also a divine spiritual aspect where the unconscious is both instinct and spirit. The bear and ancient God image has lights for eyes. It sheds illumination on the onlooker. On its forehead, it has a third eye which can see the opposites together in one. The fur is like flames because this bear is a spirit, not a physical reality. So the collective unconscious and the archetypes. So like I said, the deep ecologist and eco-psychologist are calling for the deepest possible analysis of our problems with the environment, with nature. And to set us up for looking at the collective unconscious, here's a quote from Jung. He says, man has always lived with a myth. And think, we think we are able to be born today and to live in no myth without history. That is a disease. That's absolutely abnormal. Because man is not born every day. He is born once in a specific historical setting with specific historical qualities. And therefore he is only complete when he has a relation to these things. To wipe out the connection with the past is a mutilation of the human being. So let's explore these deeper levels of the collective unconscious. And to me, this kind of demystifies the collective unconscious. Some, sometimes I think Jungians think of it as just too much of a, uh, uh, in, in, uh, impossible mystery. This is a diagram of the layers of the collective unconscious. The white at the top is in the conscious realm. And the, it goes, the, the dotted area starts with the unconscious. It goes through levels. And it's related to a dream that Jung had uh, when he was coming across in 1907 with Freud to lecture in the United States or analyzing each other's dreams. And Jung had a dream about being in his house on the second level, uh, he goes down to the first level, and it's uh, more ancient, um, I think from the 1800s. And then he goes down to the basement, oh, it's Roman times, a stone tunnel beneath a flagstone in the floor, and goes down into that tunnel chiseled in the rock, and there's a cave at the bottom with some bones and some sh uh, shards. And Jung understood that as the layers of the collective unconscious. So let's go through those layers and analyze each of them for our dysfunctional relationship with the environment. So we'll start at the top. Those A's at the top, those would be individuals from three different cultures. So uh, on the right and the middle, 
that would be like individuals from Western culture. And on the left would be an individual, let's say, from an Eastern culture. So then looking at uh, level A, that would be our human consciousness as an individual. Uh, this it would be at the personal intra-psychic level. So our relationship to the unconscious and what call, Jung called the little people within. If you think of a dream that you're in with several other people, your dream ego is closest to your conscious ego. But who are all those other people? Those would be like personifications of your complexes. You don't call them the little people within. So how we relate to the little people within, that's an ecological concept. How we relate to them is what we project into the outer world and how we relate to the outer world and ultimately how we relate to nature. So uh, ecology starts at the intrapsychic level in our dream world in our relationship to the little people within. The next level down, um, uh, B, that would be the family level. And at that level, this is something that Arlo is going to be teaching a course on. Attachment issues are huge. So if you have a poor attachment with the mother or the mothering figure, there's a deep level of anxiety with the objects, with the world. And this can lead to an empty, emptiness and a narcissism and ultimately to a consumerism. And I think it makes people more vulnerable to fundamentalist religions. I think the Catholics have the corner on the archetypal image for the mother infant bond, the Madonna and child. So if you think of an archetype like a uh, disco ball, then each uh, mirror on the surface of that will be one way that that archetype per se manifests in the world. So we're in our Western culture, the archetypal image for the mother infant stage of human development would be the Madonna and child as one image. Then we go down to the American um, level of the collective unconscious. This is how we're really different from Europe. We are so taken by the myth of the West, the cowboy, there's John Wayne. I think he grew up in Ohio. Um, and the politicians have really tried to, to tap into that myth, George Bush down in Texas or Reagan on his ranch. And the cowboy really uh, is the mythic base for our strong sense of individualism. All these Americans that don't want to get vaccinated. You can't tell me what to do. Government can't tell me what to do. And we see that the detrimental effects of something like that. So there's uh, not only is there this individualism, but there's a conquering attitude toward nature and a belief in progress. And this gets complicated by the gun culture that we have. This you'll all recognize from January 6th. And what does the gun culture do? Um, it really creates a sense of vigilantism that you can take law and order in somebody else's life into your own hands. So it goes and undercuts any sorts of laws and government systems. And this is based on an interpretation of the Second Amendment that we can keep and bear arms. And one of the ways it's interpreted is that you don't like what the government's doing. You can get your AK-47 and a bunch of paramilitary people together and you can off the government. So that's a very, uh, uh, that's something that really eats at the structure of our American democratic systems and how we are profoundly different from Europe. Then another level is our Puritan heritage that we celebrate every Thanksgiving. Now the Puritans were kind of the right wingers in, uh, in Europe in the uh, 1600s. They came in America looking to set up their pure version of Christianity. And of course, they thought that the Indians were really savages. And eventually, even though the Indians helped them survive initially, uh, they ended up slaughtering a lot of the Indians in Massachusetts. And they saw America as the shining right city on the hill. This is right out of the book of Revelations. 
And John Winthrop said, we shall always uh, be a city on a hill for all people to see. And here's Ronnie Reagan. America is and always will be a shining city on the hill. So that's where this idea of American exceptionalism comes from. And God is on our side and God's on the dollar bill. Uh, and this uh, apologies for the quality of the image, but it kind of summarizes the whole thing. So this whole movement West and eliminating uh, the, uh, the savages and, and then taking their children and putting them in these Christian schools, forbidding them to speak their language or to practice their ways. There are many Indians alive that have suffered from that. That's all part of the American shadow that we are hopefully starting to come to terms with. So that's the American part. Now we go into the European part of our American, uh, our Western part of our American collective unconscious. And there are two myths that are really important here. This is the, uh, the myth about the um, Oedipus complex. And here's Oedipus that is tricking or figuring out the riddle that the Sphinx put to him. So really what it is for the West is that human intelligence can conquer uh, can trump the great goddess of life and nature. That's what the Sphinx was. But we are poised to inflict the, the plagues of Thebes upon the entire planet. The next myth is the, from the our Western Christian tradition. And this is what uh, eco-theologian Thomas Berry said about it. He said, the uh, myth of the West is the doctrine of progress that originated in John's book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. So it says in the book of Revelation that a thousand years of abundance are supposed to precede the end of the created world. But humans decided to manifest that myth themselves when it didn't occur by divine grace. And they were going to do that by trying to bring, bring about the promised state through their own efforts by exploiting the resources of the earth. And that is from a wonderful book that I summarized as much as I could in my Dairy Farmer's Guide. It's by a book by Riley called The Forsaken Garden, Nancy Riley. Great interviews there with Lawrence Vanderpost, Marion Woodman, and her husband, Ross Woodman, and uh, eco-theologian Thomas Berry. Uh, I just love that book. So another thing that happened, and, and this is how disease has affected Christianity, the Black Plague in the uh, 1300s killed an estimated half of the Europe's population. So before that, God spoke to people, to humans in two ways. One was by revelation from above. Another was by looking at what God created. So it's like looking at a people, person's artwork or their, their, their complete creative production in their life, and you have some understanding what they're like. That was a, a revelation from nature, if you will. But because of the plague, people just wanted to get the heck out of here. Uh, and that's when Christianity became more spiritualized and removed from the body and from nature. So the other dimension then for the West is this famous Cartesian-Newtonian split. And this is what the worldview has been that resulted from that in the 17th century. So coupled with that split where basically uh, uh, mind and spirit was only in human beings and uh, with uh, Newton, that instead of God or the angels uh, guiding the planets around, these are all just laws. F equals MC squared. No, E equals MC. No, that's beyond them. Force equals mass time acceleration and gravity and so on. So you couple that worldview with the rise of capitalism, industrialization, the modern corporation, you have some of the major factors for our dysfunctional relationship with nature. 
and the belief that humans are separate from an environment that is dead and inert, and nature can and should be controlled, and individuals have a right to maximize uh, economic gain and progress equals growth. Those are some of the biggest uh, elements of our dysfunctional connection with or lack of connection with the environment. So then we go to a deeper level in the collective unconscious. This is something all cultures share. All cultures have had their pagan roots. The Chinese and India and every culture. And in that sense, we have some profound relationship. And this is a level that the eco-psychologists are interested in. If you look at indigenous cultures, they all have had a sacred relationship with nature. They practice reciprocity with each other and with nature. They live in small groups with a democratic process and they are rooted to their place. In fact, their language ever, emerges out of the place that they, uh, their, their tribe or culture is. That's called topophilia. And they believe in synchronicity. And Jung said that we're not going to have a complete worldview unless we add synchronicity to it. Now, here's where Jungians make a real uh, significant contribution to being able to connect to the land and how it's related to indigenous cultures. So um, an animated cosmos survives in our unconscious, unconscious in dreams. And they immerse us in what Hillman called zoological cathedrals. And Jung felt that the animal soul is at the foundation of human life. And he associated that with instincts and the animal drives, especially sex sexuality. And he said the loss of animals in religious symbols and creeds marks the beginning of the dissociation between religion and nature and the loss of the power of symbols. Jung said we should extend loving our neighbor to loving the animal in us. To be truly human, he believed, and to reach our unique potential, we have to be in relationship with animals. This is both an outer relationship to animals and an innate inter inner relationship to the collective unconscious coming to us in the terms of coming to terms with the animal in our inheritance. So at the inner level, Jung said, whenever we touch nature, we get clean. People have got dirty through too much civilization. They take a walk in the woods or a bath in the sea. This is from the outside entering the unconscious, entering yourself through dreams is touching nature from the inside. And this is the same thing. Things are put right. So you can enter the nature through these two domains. And you have to add to this Jung saying that we are part of nature. And that is reflected most purely in our dream world. And this is by one of my favorite artists, Susan Boulay. Uh, she's, uh, many women had her paint their animals from their dreams, their spirit animals, and so on. And a, one of my favorite quotes about the connection with dreams and its relationship to the creativity of nature. This is from Ron Franz uh, from a book and a movie called The Way of the Dream. So at the source of the dream, there is a creative mystery which we cannot rationally explain. It's the creativity of nature. It's the same creativity which has created what, what man could never invent. The millions of species of animals and flowers and plants on the earth. The dreams are also like flowers or plants. They are something unique which we can only marvel at. And that for Jung would be related to the idea of the objective psyche and the reality of the psyche. So one of my models for this realm and being able to enter the realm is the Native American vision quest. 
I've had the good fortune because of my friend Fred Gustafson, who was a Lutheran minister and a sun dancer and a Jungian analyst, um, um, of being able to uh, participate in many Native American ceremonies. And I was able to do a two-day vision quest. But for the Lakota Sioux, like on the Great Plains, South Dakota, North Dakota, and so on, as soon as the boys hit adolescence, they would put up on the hill. So for four days and nights without food and water in a sacred place and with their uh, holy man, shaman, and their family praying for him, the youth would be praying for a vision or a spirit animal. And the way I think of it is why you're deliberately stressing the psyche and the psyche rallies by giving you a sense of your essence, your unique essence. And that comes in the form of your spirit animal. And one of the books that Jung really liked was Black Elk Speaks. And it was about a powerful uh, Teton Sioux holy man who when, in, when nine years old was unconscious for 12 days and was given the entire spiritual pantheon of the Lakota of the uh, to, uh, Lakota tradition. And then the rest of his life, when he became a shaman, he was trying to manifest those inspirations. In the I Ching, it's like uh, taking the inspiration of hexagram two and manifesting it, hexagram one and manifesting it in hexagram two. So black elk was his spirit animal, but elk aren't black. So it's a combination of the symbolism and the meaning of the elk, they're kind of charismatic animals, with black, which is the power of the West, the strongest power associated with thunderstorms on and the Great Plains. And uh, Brave Buffalo, a Teton Sioux said, let a man decide upon his favorite animal and make a study of it, learning its innocent ways. Let him learn to understand its sounds and motions. The animals want to communicate with man. Man must do the greater part in securing that understanding. So if you had a spirit animal, then the thing is that the, the, the Indian would study that animal, would learn its songs and its gates. And maybe if it was an eagle, you, you would uh, have a, a whistle that you at this uh, powwows and so on, you would try to make the sound of the eagle and the, the try to pretend to fly like an eagle. That's all by way of embodying it. And our artists help us do that. And this is the paintings of one of my favorite uh, Wisconsin uh, artists. And it's uh, Peter Thomas Utek. And uh, this is a huge wall mural. Here is another painting with horns, more horns more horns. And here's a modern version of it. I was down at Chicago uh, for some event at the Jung Institute around Christmas time. Took a walk up Michigan Avenue here in the store. Display of Neiman Marcus with these two women. So this idea of the animal uh, and so on is uh, archetypally alive in our culture. So I think uh, this will be a good point to pause and uh, take some questions, maybe for 10 minutes, and then we'll take a break and uh, come back for the next section. So um, Amy, uh, I guess you're going to monitor the uh, questions that people may have and so on. It's uh, Danielle. And Danielle, okay. if you have any uh, question for Dennis, um, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And um, once you raise your hand, I will prompt you to unmute your microphone and then call on you to ask the question live. There we got one. Hi, Margaret. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Uh, um, good, thank you. So, Dunas, this is an amazing presentation. As you know, I've uh, met you by email. 
Um, and this kind of comes at an important time for me. Um, I live across from a lake, Rice Lake and Whitewater. And there's a lot of blue green algae and I've been working really hard to speak with some of the neighbors um, and find a way to not pour the fertilizer all over the lawns. And um, it's, I really am not having any success. Um, I am, I'm 100% into nature. I canoe twice a day if I can. Um, even, you know, today when the weather is good, I appreciate all the wildlife. Um, I'm finding that a lot of people uh, buy a house, they never even get close to the lake. They don't see the condition of the lake. It's all about property value. Um, I've had some, um, well, this is getting specific, but some issues with a, a fertilizer company, Tree, True Green. Um, it's just very frustrating because I feel like I'm dealing with people who don't, are not, interested in the in the nature of it it's it's just about property but that's even odd too because they don't seem to care about um, their property value going down if the lake is all blue green algae toxic so mm -hmm. anyway I didn't know if you could comment on that that's kind of like a practical issue related to, to what you've been talking about oh yeah I'll I'll mention something a little bit later on when I talk about a sacred dream I had in Switzerland that got me started uh, to connecting with the land very deeply. And um, in one way I'm doing it here in the city, not without some flack, is I've turned my rundown front and backyards into a prairie garden, wildflowers. I think I have about 45 species of wildflowers out there. And uh, no fertilizers, no pesticides, no herbicides. And it's just such a delight to look out. Every day I look out there and see what's blooming now, the sequence of blooms, the, the phenology and so on. I love all the insects around it and so on. And I'm hoping that'll be some kind of a model for my neighbors, but I'm not sure because a month and a half ago, I got a letter from the city saying that my grass and weeds had to be cut down to less than seven inches tall. Um, oh, gosh. So I was uh, all primed for a good fight with the city. And then they called me and said, oh, um, we looked at the pictures that the city took coming out there and we realized you have a prairie garden. But I think the reason that I got called oh. in was somebody two houses down was uh, selling their house and uh, they didn't want a lot of weeds in the neighborhood. But it's a different mentality. <laughs> but I'm convinced that this is how we're going to have to uh, uh, educate our children. But also, mm -hmm. we have to talk to it to the city uh, about fertilizers and so on. What I do, I scoop up the leaves in the street, not only in front of my house, but houses on either side. I put them on my prairie garden for mulch. Um, and as a result, and, and not raking the uh, leaves, you know, I have a lot of insects there. We have fireflies and so on. So like I said, uh, if you give nature a chance, I didn't plant the golden rats. I didn't plant the asters and so on. They're all there. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And, but that's the kind of, of uh, feeling for the land that we have to establish. And that's one of the premises in, in eco-psychology. If people feel connected to the land and love it, they're naturally going to want to preserve it and protect it. You're not going to have to just have a bunch of laws. So that's the one of the premises in eco-psychology. But good luck with that. Mm -hmm. uh, these fertilizers, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, uh, and, and people just don't make their connections. It's uh, it's that kind of a culture we're in, private property and property values. And, and it is a problem in urban areas that um, mm -hmm. growing mm -hmm. up on a farm, it was natural for me to be connected to nature, but uh, not for a lot of ur urban people. But here in Milwaukee, we have an urban ecology center. If you're not familiar with it, Google it. They're doing oh, wonderful okay. stuff with inner city kids and everything. You got, they have money for buses and and so on, programs all the time. The Schlitz Audubon Center is up the road as well. 
Um, these are things uh, we can do with people in the cities. So thanks for your, okay, great. your call. Yeah, thank, thank you. I will, unfortunately, I'll miss your last hour because I have to pick up my son at school, but I will um, listen to your dream and the, the rest of it on the recording. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions for Dennis during this time? Give it. Uh, looks like that's what we have for right now. All right. Let's take a 10 minute break then. Okay. Um, okay. Shall I start? Yes, uh, Debbie, you have your hand up. Hi, um, yeah, just I wanted to say when you showed that fabulous image of the two women in red with the antlers. Yes. I immediately thought of Alexander McQueen, who's a British costume designer who had a very highly attended event at the, at the Metropolitan in New York. And he did, he did um, outfits that were made out of leaves and he used, um, this one was the, the deer antler or whatever caribou, I'm not sure what it was, it was breaking a very expensive lace. And it was all about, there was oyster dresses and feathers and ones that were made out of leaves. So you might wanna, you might enjoy his work. Could you send me a link to that? I'd love to see it. Yeah, I put a, something in the chat, um, but I don't have the, it's not the link. And Dan, Danielle was going to, I was asking <laughs> Danielle to help me, but. Um, I'll try to, I'll, you, I, you I, texted I, it to me, so I'll try to get it on my computer. <laughs> okay. For our, and I'll share Thank it with you. everybody. Very powerful images, Dennis. Thank you so much. Uh, we, 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 need, we need artists to, um, to help us with our environmental issues. And uh, somebody had contacted me when I did my workshop through Zoom in California about the horns and, and dreams she's had about horns and so on. So it's powerful. Yes, it is. I th Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, sure. So I put this image back up of the layers of the collective unconscious now that we've gone through it. So uh, ego at the top, Jung thought the family level of the un, uh, was in conscious realm, but I think a lot of that is in the unconscious realm. It's a little easier to retrieve than some of the deeper levels. So level C there is he called the clan level. I kind of think of like extended family. And then level D, that would be like the, um, kind of like the American uh, level of the collective unconscious versus the European. Then E would be our Western unconscious. Uh, and it really in this, uh, this model, for me to put the American collective unconscious in D, uh, that means that this would not distinguish like the Western collective unconscious from the East. But then you get to F, the light brown, that would be the animal ancestors that East and West and all cultures have in common. And the dark brown at the bottom, that would be the animal uh, ancestors, like the animal soul. And because in the indigenous cultures, uh, people had spirit animals and there were bush animals, your bush spirit and so on, Jung said that showed how close the, uh, our uh, ancestors and our unconscious is to the uh, animal ancestor realm. Uh, and then the, the diagonal lines, that's what Jung called the central fire, kind of the energy of the universe. It permeates all the levels. I kind of think of that as the energy of the universe, but also kind of the mathematics that runs the universe, uh, like complexity theory and so on. I will touch a little bit about that later on. Um, and all those levels are to be thought of as interacting and affecting each other all the time. It's not one level uh, isolated from the other. So I'm going to get back in here and go to where we left off. Yes. Uh, so there is uh, the book that Fred published, 
called Dancing Between Two Worlds, Jung and the Native American Soul. And uh, he just so totally got into the Sundance and Native American ceremonies that year after year, he was voted Mr. Sundance. And he didn't have a drop of Indian blood in him, but like the uh, holy man, the interpreter that we worked with, or was it El uh, Albert Whitehat, said, it's really uh, your native if you have a native soul and a native way of looking at the world. And I've been so blessed to have been able to participate in the Native American ceremonies. You can't read about this stuff. If you ever have an opportunity to go to a sweat lodge or something, take it. Um, the rituals, the uh, connection to the land by the way the, the sweat lodge is formed and so on. Uh, it's, it's like one of my psychiatrist friends said, the sweat lodge is the ultimate spiritual technology. It's totally the opposite of going to church on Sunday with your Sunday best. So I didn't get any spirit animals on my vision quest. I got a couple in my dreams. But what has influenced me the most, I had a lot of big dreams my last year of training in Switzerland. And this was a single image dream, but one of the most powerful and beautiful in my life. This is not the dream, of course. I got this off the internet. But... Um, it was of a typical Wisconsin meadow or pasture scene. And there was some alfalfa or Timothy. And of course, as an entomologist, there had to be some insects flying above the field. It was a gently rolling topography, some trees on the horizon, a beautiful summer day, blue sky, puffy white clouds. That was it, just a meadow scene. But it's the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And I lived in California for many years and a California girlfriend, I call it. And we went around the whole state in her uh, Volkswagen Beetle and uh, went up the Oregon coast, seen the Canadian Rockies, Swiss Alps, lived in Switzerland six years. I'd never seen anything as beautiful as what's in that dream. So what you do with that, like I was saying, the same thing you do with if, if the spirit animal, you take that as an image of your essence. It's like an image of your soul. So it's one of the reasons we moved back to Wisconsin when I finished training in Zurich with my young family. And what I've been doing since then, I've been trying to figure out what is so powerful about the land and the spirit here in the upper Midwest. Um, and what you do then is, um, let me see the next slide. Um, so if, if you're talking about an animal, you have, let's say you dreamt of a grizzly bear, then you read about the grizzly bear, you read stories, you read Indian tales, you learn about the, the zoology and so on, you go to a zoo and look at it, but uh, you want to try to be in the environment that that animal's from. That animal evolved in that environment. So uh, you want to immerse yourself without getting too close to a grizzly bear uh, to in that particular environment. So I used um, all the Jungian techniques to develop my, to embody my sacred meadow dream. And that I conveyed in the book, Land, Weather, Seasons, Insects, and Archetypal View, and um, how did I describe it here? So this involves the use of science, myths, symbols, dreams, Native American spirituality, imaginal psychology associated that with Hillman, and the I Ching uh, as ways of immersing myself. I did a, uh, a documentary on the drumlin scenery here in Wisconsin, but what I've been doing the past several years is going to this wonderful beach we have here in Milwaukee County beside Lake Michigan called Atwater Beach. And this is where I go to exercise. Um, and I always have my cell phone and I must at least have a hundred fabulous photos like this. So when I go there, I remind myself that uh, like at this, this is what my soul looks like 
at 7.25 in the morning on May 25th, 2021. And then I look at every element in the environment as an aspect of my soul, like part of the gestalt. It's a way of just really sinking into it. And like I said, I'm just so fortunate to be beside Lake Michigan. The clouds, um, the, the weather can change so quickly, depending on whether the wind's coming off the lake or not. The temperature, the, the waves, the wave patterns. Uh, another thing that you track when you're going there every day to exercise is see the phenology, the sequence of the flowering of the plants. And so important, the different scents and the smells from the particular flowers that are there. And the noises, the red-winged blackbirds, these noisy birds, I mean, they start coming in in April. And it's kind of a relief when they finally leave sometime in June. Um, and there's all the human activities that go on there. Here's another image. So this would be like an image for my soul. Maybe you see where the sun is, because you also notice the quality of the light and the position in the sky and so on. This is, this is probably uh, somewhere more into August and so on. So and again, the changes of the seasons. And it was Hillman who talked about the importance, like I mentioned early, um, of getting Jungian psychology, getting therapy out of the office, out into the world. And he used a Neoplatonic concept of Aphrodite, the goddess of sensuality, love, um, and beauty as uh, the god, as the soul of the world. So here is uh, the birth of Venus, uh, which was Aphrodite. That's his Botticelli in the uh, Uffizi Museum in uh, Florence. I mean, it's just incredible to be in that room. And here is my Lake Michigan version of that. I was out there exercising one morning, and there was a photographer taking a picture of this woman in a wedding dress standing in Lake Michigan. So that's uh, my personal image of uh, the birth of Venus. And here's another image of her. Another way that uh, responding to Margaret's uh, uh, statement before that I connect with the land and I did it during the break. Uh, this is looking out my office window. It's just here to my left. That's where the light's coming in on the left side of my head. And I converted it to a wildflower garden, and I wanted some cup plant plants, those are the tall ones on the right, that would be tall enough so my clients could see it when they're sitting in, in the office. So uh, I can't tell you how much joy I get looking when I'm having my lunch. Uh, I just lean on the kitchen window and look out into the garden and see what's changing it. You can't see the plants grow, but from day to day, especially in the spring, you can see them change. And I looked out there a couple of weeks ago and I thought I have the whole history of summer there. The goldenrods, uh, they, they peaked sometime in August, early September. The cup plants, those tall ones on the right, they peaked in July, et cetera, et cetera. And when I went out during the break, it's the scent. And there were just bumble, uh, honeybees everywhere. Our neighbor, block over has a little honeybee hive on his front porch. So these are all, I'm probably feeding his, his bees. But the, the bumblebees love the cup plants. And as you probably know, the bumblebee populations are really being threatened. So put your native plants in if you possibly can. You don't have to water. You don't have to pay people to come out and fertilize. And then when they put the pesticides on, like our neighbor did, then they put a sign up, keep the, the children and the dogs off. So you know it's toxic. And here's a, a closer view looking out my window. So Jung hammered us about increasing our consciousness. And we tend to think of that as increasing our psychological consciousness, greater knowledge about what's happening in our psyche and our relationships with people. But I'm saying now it is equally important 
that we be conscious of how unique our species is in that we have been able to generate a whole era named after us, the Anthropocene era. So every species is concerned about its survival and of itself as an individual and to varying degrees to other members of its species. But we are unique in that we have to be of conscious of the survival of the other species on the planet, because we have so messed things up that this deepest level of the collective unconscious, and I forgot that's why I put that slide up, that's where I think we are being most disturbed by our animal ancestor soul and our psyches, because we are messing up the very, the basic things that every living thing needs for survival, food, uh, shelter, water. Uh, and that's why I, that's where I think the deepest anxiety is coming from uh, in the youth, especially because they know that at some unconscious level, if nothing else, that we're messing up the requirements for um, animals to live. So the greater consciousness that Jung called for will be a much greater sensitive, sensitivity to the complex interrelatedness in everything. And Hillman said that the pathologies of the environment are going to make us aware that we're part of the environment. So if we can have such an effect on the environment that we're screwing it up so much that we're making our lives miserable, we must be part of the environment. That's Hillman's argument. And I'm saying that, that it's going to be forced upon us to develop an ecological consciousness because of what's happening in the environment. And I'm saying that that consciousness then that we have to extend down to our relationship with each other as a species and extend it all the way down, <coughs> excuse me, to our dream world and the little, pe little people within. So it's like a fractal going across all of these levels. And this ecological consciousness is what I see as I describe it as Jung's new age paradigm shift that I'll get into in a minute, will have an ecological framework. <clears throat> so what Jungians then bring to the environmental movement uh, is this uh, archetypal framework. And think particularly of the Greek gods, the Greeks personified basic forces in themselves and in the environment. I don't know how conscious they were of it, but it's like to get a better sense of what these forces are in or and out or acting on us, let's personify them. Uh, so they, they made up these myths and stories and um, made statues and paintings and had plays. And the, uh, the temples were related in a particular location with particular uh, plants around them, which were therefore mean particular scents and insects. Each one had uh, kind of a gestalt to give you a sense of what the essence was that that god or goddess was personifying. So you think of Apollo, for example, would be the personification of what is now science. So uh, Apollo was uh, far-sighted, could look into the mind of Zeus, um, and kind of how the universe was structured and so on, and purity. As a scientist, especially if you're a pathologist and you're doing your experiments, boy, you've got to be anal about a pure environment so you don't contaminate your, uh, your experimental, uh, what you're experimenting with. So Apollo is the god of science, and his brother I mentioned before is Hermes, the trickster. And uh, there he is with his uh, staff and his winged feet and so on. And this, uh, I am saying that the myth of Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle is the myth for eco-psychology. Uh, 500 BCE in Athens, the Greeks worked out the relationship between the trickster who was 
kind of in some ways mythically dimensioned as uh, developed as Norman O. Brown pointed out in his wonderful book called Hermes the Thief, that the mercantile class was developing in Athens at the time. They didn't have a god. Apollo was associated with the Acropolis and the, the landed gentry and so on. And this myth of Apollo stealing, uh, uh, Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle was the way that the, uh, in a way that the uh, uh, mercantile class was siphoning off some of the attributes and powers from Apollo's domain. But then in that myth, uh, Zeus forced Apollo and Hermes to become best of friends. And uh, Hermes did it through music, the power of music. And I develop all that in my book on uh, Hermes. So think of it this way. If you look at the gods and goddesses as representing basic human experiences and basic things in the environment and personifying it, then you look at the pantheon for a culture. And then you then from an archetypal level, you try to see, you try to get some sense of which gods and gods are a little more powerful than others, with the idea if that if any god or goddess becomes too powerful, the rest will gang up on and tear them down. And that's kind of a situation we are in Western culture. But uh, a, a way of framing the situation is that if you look at the great mother archetype, what does the great mother want? She wants food for her children. She wants protection from disease. She wants good shelter and she wants adequate water supply and so on. These are basic human needs. So Saturn, the god Saturn, sets up the structures, economic, legal structures and so on, to help um, manifest the wonders of science and technology, to help manipulate the environment, to give us humans all that sort of stuff. But we have bent the laws of nature. We've been able to figure them out. We just didn't instinctually fit into and evolve uh, to like that bear, to, to eat salmon and do bear-like things. We have, we're smart enough and with our opposable thumbs in our hands and upright posture, et cetera, et cetera, we're able to figure out the laws of the universe and with science and so on and technology to manipulate them all to our advantage but so much to our advantage that we're going to destroy up to half the other species on the planet. So, um, ooh, so let's stay with this for a bit. Um, so that's uh, an archetypal way of looking at it. The other Jungian element that I picked up on is Jung said the modern day monsters and dragons are the big things. So he mentioned the big militaries, big governments, big machines. But this particular example really struck me. He said, imagine how the little merchant felt when he was gobbled up by the Standard Oil Trust. Well, we have that problem on steroids now. It's called the International Corporation. So, and this has even been personified. The, Supreme, the Citizens United decision gave corporations like the rights of a person. So if this were a person, it would be the ultimate monster on the planet. It's a person that is always trying to eliminate its competition. It's there to make money for the shareholders on a time frame of the quarterly profit reports. Humans are, are expendable. And the environment is a resource based on a waste dump. And now we've got the best government and Supreme Court that money can buy. It favors the rights of the corporations and the wealthier. So it's contributing to the growing inequalities, especially in American society. So uh, this is uh, an ugly enough image I chose from the internet. And to me, that monster and alien was just too sickly. But uh, this goes back to what I opened up with talking about, um, about what a bad situation our planet is. 
is in. And to me, this is one of the personifications of why things are so bad. And if we can't address the powers of the corporation, I think we're just going to be rearranging the chairs on the proverbial deck of the Titanic, because uh, we're always going to be playing a catch up game. So this part I put in here um, that because uh, it's pretty complex. And uh, I, I tend to lose a lot of people when I get too much into kind of the more scientific and academic things. But as a scientist, I have been so excited by the application of complexity theory. Remember I said before that the, what Jung called the central fire, I think the, the, uh, these uh, formulas that we have in complexity theory and so on are part of that basic structure of the universe that we experience as well. So I'm just going to put these slides up on the screen. And for those of you interested, you're going to be getting the, uh, uh, a copy of the presentation. You can go back and look at the ones that you want to. So it talks about uh, an organism. An organism starts off with a, a, an, an organization at the subatomic level. It goes up to galaxies. And we humans are organisms. There are basic premises that go throughout every system that's an organism. And the some of the basic dynamics in that can be described by this wonderful mathematics called complexity theory that one of my colleagues at Chicago, George Hoganson, has done such wonderful things in applying that to basic Jungian concepts like complexes and the self. Uh, so listen to some of George's presentations to really get into that. And Hillman picked up on that. Um, Hillman, fortunately, had a fondness for insects. He wanted me to do my thesis at the Young Institute on Insects, but I was trying to distance myself from entomology for a while. And Hillman was always attacking the concept of the ego. And he thought we should think of us, ourselves more like a bee's nest or an ant, an ant's nest. And bees and ants work on the basic principles of complexity theory. That's their searching behavior and so on. Uh, uh, that's a, the mathematical description, and that's complexity theory is what's operative in our dream world, and it's also at the basis of melodic music. Um, and I have, I think, one of my contributions, there was a complexity theory group met at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I attended it for about a year and a half, and I gave a, a talk that all those academics um, didn't know what to make of, but I have Hermes posited as the god of complexity theory. So you think of every god and goddess representing some essential aspect of being human or in nature. And it's so clear that Hermes represents what we now call complexity theory. And I go into that, and here's a slide for that, um, and another slide for that and about the symbolic domain uh, being Hermes domain as George Hogerson has developed it. And all of that I developed in Hermes Ecopsychology and Complexity Theory. And I go into that somewhat in a talk. If you Google Orange County Young Society, Dennis Merritt E. Jing, I made uh, a link between Hermes and the Tao and the, uh, the, the gap between what Lao Tzu called the dark enigma and the 10,000 things. And it's pretty clear that from our Western tradition, we have an archetypal image of what that gap is. And it's depicted as the gap in Hermes Juan. Uh, I'll stop talking about Hermes. I'm, it's the only Greek god I know something about. But um, uh, Hermes is what you don't see in that wand. It's the gap. And those two arms coming up, that's any kind of opposite that you want to talk about, matter, spirit, male, female, and so on. And Hermes is about the relationship and the exchanges between those two things. Of course, they can be exchanges between many things, but at a simple, most fundamental level, he's about the gap. So people that get confused, like, is Hermes male, female? He's both. I mean, he's neither. He's about the relationship between the two. And at the most profound level, it's the, uh, the ego relationship to the self. 
And it's uh, for Jung and his terminology and his Christian background, it's like uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel. He said, if you talk about the unconscious, it's like medicalizing it. It's uh, to bring it to life. It's like you wrestling with God and what's, what's God doing to me and the planet and so on and so on. It has to be uh, that deep an engagement. And, and, and Jung would, would say that in, in, a, in some slide I'll present later on, that is uh, about the qualities of the new age that by engaging it that deeply and looking at the mess we're at the planet at these many different levels and what's happening in our culture, especially here in America with the polarization that you're hoping that the transcendent function will kick in and give us some symbols for unification to bring us all together. And uh, uh, Joseph Campbell said that if a new religion to, were to emerge, it would have an ecological basis. So another aspect that I'm just going to mention in passing, um, Hermes, Hermes, Freudian Jungian slip. Jung and Wolfgang Pauli, one of the most brilliant nuclear physicists, said that you had to add synchronicity to indestructible energy, space-time continuum, and the constant connection through affect, namely causality, to have a complete view of the universe. And that would plug us in to the indigenous worldview. And Hermes is also the god of synchronicity. And this is, uh, I mentioned this in the Orange County talk, uh, to me it's the greatest uh, statistical proof of synchronicity. This one dog is talked about on pages some between 50 and 60 of the experiment they did with this one dog and it's just absolutely phenomenal. So I put this slide up, uh, I'm talking about all the Jungian uh, contributions to eco-psychology. If you want a nice overview of eco-psychological practices, go to Carl Golden's uh, Tree of Life website, and uh, you find a nice whole list there. So let's switch into another little domain here. Um, this is a quote by Carl Sagan. This is almost 30 years ago, folks. Um, Carl Sagan was co-chair of Religion and Science for the Environment. And this group put out this statement. It said, the environmental problem has religious as well as scientific dimensions. As scientists, many of us have had a profound experience of awe and reverence before the universe. I think of say, Sagan, billions and billions of stars. Uh, we understand that what is regarded as sacred is more likely to be treated with care and respect. Our planetary home should be so regarded. Efforts to safeguard and cherish the environment must be infused with a vision of the sacred. This is a scientist talking. At the same time, a much wider and deeper appreciation of science and technology is needed. If we do not understand the problem, it is unlikely we will, we will be able to fix it. Thus, there is a vital role for science and religion. So here you see how my individuation process is really connected with bringing those two things together through Jungian psychology. And look at what's happening in America. We have some people with their own version of the facts. I could not believe that people would not listen to the science of epidemiology and pathologists uh, and literally take their own lives in their, own, their hands by not getting vaccinated. So uh, it's a commentary on where we are now. But the question, uh, the question is then, how do we develop these things? Well, one approach to this is Jung saying we need more psychology because we are the source of all coming evil. So um, got to find my quote on that. Um, 
So if we don't uh, deal with our own shadow side, we're not going to be a good activist. We are going to be projecting our shadow onto other people and tend to treat them more like enemies. So we always have to start or always have to incorporate our own intra-psychic phenomena when dealing with the world. I saw a lot of that in Berkeley. And when I left Berkeley to go to Zurich in 1977, I realized I no more wanted to be under the far left than the far right. And we see some of that happening now in, in uh, political correctness. So this to me is the most exciting dimension of Jungian psychology. And it's the dimension I think we have to be working in to deal with the environmental crisis and the human crisis. And that's what Jung called a new age. So Jung, because of his Christian background and so on, really went deeply into the whole history and evolution of Christianity. And because he was in the alchemy, he had to understand a lot about astrology. There are a lot of astro astrological symbols in, in, um, in alchemy. So Jung's deepest analysis of the West and Christianity, hang on, let me uh, close my shade here a little bit. I just love this corner office for all the natural life and light that we have. So Jung's symbolic summation is that the Christian era is associated with the astrological sign of Pisces. And that is two fish swimming in opposite directions. So the wise men that were coming from the east were undoubtedly astrologers. So they recognized something. This would be the, you know, the uh, an archetypal tag on maybe to the birth of Jesus. So Jung felt that for the first thousand years, the Christian psyche had to be built up. But then the second thousand years, it kind of went downhill from then on until in 1940, when Jung uh, thought that we were beginning to enter the age of Aquarius. It was Jung who coined the terms new age and age of Aquarius in 1940. And think of what was happening in 1940, World War, Hitler, Mussolini, and he was seeing a deterioration in the environment. In 1940, he's probably rolling over in his grave now. So. Um, this is the setup for this part. Uh, some of you may recognize this is the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, Bascom Hill. There's Abe uh, sitting on top of the hill. Uh, behind them is the administrative center. The hill, by the way, is a drumlin. Um, and it's looking at the state capitol to the east, which is also on a drumlin. And that building below the state capitol, that's Memorial Library. Now we're going to go downhill. And there's the library on the left, uh, emblematic of academia. There's that big new Catholic church with the tallest steeple. Uh, next to, on your, the far right, is the press house. So there's represents Protestantism. Down the street, connected by the State Street, is the state capital. So you have academia, religion, politics together. Now, if you go, one more scene here. If you, there's the Catholic Church, Protestant, uh, Presbyterian Church. If you enter the library, that kind of fortress there, this is what you're going to see. It's hidden in plain sight, this big mosaic. And I think 99.99% .99 of the people don't realize what's going on here. And the author's statement doesn't say, this is right out of the book of Revelation that Jung picked up on. The author, the artist called it um, linking above and below. But on the right there, what the heck's going on? This is from the book of Revelation. After all this ecocide and destruction of everything on the planet, there's this moment when the heavens open up and a pregnant woman starts to descend. Jung said a very pagan image in John's vision. Standing on a crescent moon, has the sun on her chest. You can, can barely see it. She has a crown of 12 stars. And now she's got an infant in her arms and she's confronted by a seven-headed dragon. 
So Yahweh withdraws the infant into heaven, hides the woman in the wilderness, and then the destruction continues. Jung said this infant represents a consciousness Christians were not ready for 2,000 years ago. But he said that that infant represents the consciousness of the new age, and this is from Man and His Symbols, and von Franz says this about it. The new spirit of the coming age of Aquarius, riding on a white beast Pegasus, half horse, half boar. Wherever he stretches his hands, new life begins to bloom. This boy God predicted in Revelation is the complete man of the future. The round object like a sun behind the youth is a symbol of totality. And the boy's four arms recall other four, four, four fold symbols that characterize psychological wholeness. He is black because of his nocturnal unconscious orig origins. So here's what Jung was talking about. Uh, there's uh, Pisces and Pegasus constellation above Aquarius. And then this is what the constellation Pegasus looks like, the winged horse. This is as far as Jung could go. Uh, Aquarius is an air sign, not a water sign. It could consciously determine where to orient emotional energies. So Aquarius is pouring water into the mouth of the southern fish. Jung saw that as the collective unconscious. So the challenge for the age of Aquarius will be to bring as much consciousness as possible into all these layers of the collective unconscious. And that was Jung's definition of enlightenment. He said, you don't become enlightened by imagining figures of light. You do it by bringing as much consciousness as possible into the unconscious. Now, this is the, from the first tower. I took this picture when I jumped over the fence. And, uh, below that window, you see uh, engraving. And I put that picture on the cover of my book. And um, this is the description of it. This is Jung's relief carving. Description reads, this is 1958. This is three years before he died. The inscription reads, may the light arise, which I have borne in my body. This is light coming out of nature, not from above, from a revelation. The woman reaching out to milk the mare is Jung's anima. I think it looks like Jung. Uh, his inner feminine, a quote, millennia old ancestress, end of quote. The image is an anticipation of the age of Aquarius under the constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse. The feminine element is said to receive a special role in the new eon. Jung suggested that the springs gushing forth from the hoofs of Pegasus, also known as the font horse, are associated with the water bearer, the age of Aquarius. You find a wonderful manifestation of this in Dallas, Texas. If you go downtown to what had been the, uh, the winged horse, uh, is that mobile oil? Um, at the base of that, it must have been inspired by Hillman when he was down there. They have, um, they opened up a uh, spring that had been shut off at the base of that building, and they used that water to run through like an abstract of the Texas Hill Country, and the water flows by rocks uh, dedicated to each of the muses. So, uh, my favorite place in Dallas helped eliminate some of my negative associations to Kennedy getting assassinated down there. So what are the attributes of the, young, the new age? And from what I could decipher, um, these are some of the attributes. A special role for the feminine in the new age. This is one of my images for that. Here's another one. Emergence of new spiritual forms. This I mentioned before, Christian integration of vital elements of heathenism they had been persecuting. Jung's talk about the importance of, um, of uh, uh, the integrating our cultured side with the two million year old man within. And into the degradation of the environment. And I mentioned this before, painful awareness of the fragmentation within ourself uh, and our society and the God image that will hopefully 
provide a transcendent function to produce a new whole God image that leads to transformation and psychological growth. And I posit Hermes, like I said, of the God of um, eco-psychology. And these are the reasons I mentioned it for that we'll, we'll go on here. And an age of Aquarius educational system. Um, so I would use Jung's ecological model. And I wrote about this in my volume one. And I let myself imagine this because here in Milwaukee, we have so many of these, um, uh, well, what do they call them? Schools are outside of the main school system. A lot of them are conservative Christian schools. So I thought this gave me the freedom to think, why not a K through 12 system based on Jung and eco-psychological principles? So if I were setting that system up and I just provided a sketch in volume one, I would use Jung's eco ecological model of the psyche and the self or the framework. I would teach psychology that's useful, psychology about the shadow, projection, animonymous, the self. I would instruct about archetypes and the evolution of the Western symbol system that's related to Christianity and how that has contributed to our dysfunctional relationship with the environment, as I reviewed when I went through those various layers of the collective unconscious. Incorporate a sense of the numinous. Jung said, if you don't have that, you don't have a holistic culture. I would use age-appropriate dreams, fairy tales, and movies to engage and educate the students. I would use Native American stories and films at all grade levels. Beginning at the ninth grade, I would talk about the Greek myths of Hermes, and Hillman helped develop this for me, who was worshipped as a phallus and could easily fantasize about sexuality, especially for men. We don't have a sacred image for phallic energy. And Robert Bly picked up on that and where he made a fairy tale into the basis of the men's movement by picking up on Iron Hans. That's about the suppression of aggression um, and sexuality in the male. And in, in one way you can interpret it. I would discuss and show films about Native American vision quest as a model for the self for kids. Jungian psychology is so much about second half of life. This is a model we can use to talk about the self um, starting in adolescence. And I would describe Hermes as a god of complexity theory, alchemy, relationship to the unconscious, advertising, business, and eco-psychology. And uh, why don't we take another little break here? I just put out a lot of stuff and uh, uh, for some questions. And then um, come back and I'll talk about an archetypal framework for from the I Ching for going forward. Great. All right. Um, all right. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will call on you here. This, by the way, is the cup my second daughter gave me. It's so true. Can you um, read it out loud? It says, I love how you don't even need to say it out loud that I'm your favorite child. <laughs> That's the second child speaking. <laughs> All right. Uh, looks like Debbie, you have a question. My question to you was the mosaic the where you were talking about the pregnant woman that was in the I couldn't Memorial see, Library. I just I couldn't see where she was on that image. Oh really? Maybe I'll go back to the broader view. Okay. So see off on the right it, there? It made it so I couldn't follow what you were saying. Okay, point again. So if you look at the on the right there, she's at the right edge of your screen. And she's just before oh, the sign for, for Aquarius. All right, all right. I'm seeing one of those back and forth things. I see her head now. So she's green with the She's the green child. and then she's got an orange on her chest. And you see those um, dragons circling above her. So I'll advance the uh, screen. There's a close up. Right next to this, this oh. guy knew just what he was doing. She's, she's uh, between Pisces and Aquarius. He knew he was uh, depicting something out of the book of Revelation. 
But I, I didn't even realize that until I'd gone into the library many times. And one day I looked up and, oh, my God, this is what Jung was writing about. So connect it one more time for me. Explain what you're seeing there between Pisces and Aquarius. Okay. So Jung associated Pisces with the age of Aquarius because right. Jesus was born at the beginning of the age of Pisces. And that's two fish in opposite direction. First yeah. thousand years build up the Christian psyche. Second thousand years, the shadow side of Christianity comes out, including the degradation of the environment, the atomic bomb, the Holocaust, and so on. Um, and then that consciousness that that boy represents there, Christians weren't ready for it then. So Jung hid that uh, Jung, Freudian slip. Jungian Freudian slip that consciousness went back into the unconscious for 2000 years and it's beginning to emerge now in what Jung called the age of Aquarius. So here's a woman and a child, think of attachment theory as well, uh, and mother earth and so on uh, as a, a foundational image for the new age, which will have an ecological framework. Summary. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, we have time for like another question or why don't I press stop share so people can see my face. If some other questions look like we have a lot of chat statements. Yeah, there's um, no question in the chat. If you want to continue for with your presentation then. Oh, wait, we got one hand up here. Okay. Sometimes it takes a minute. So, <laughs> uh, Cynthia, hi. Hi. So I'm just wondering if we, if we in, in order to be a doable, we're all looking for um, something doable in our own life at this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we were to um, get behind in terms of supporting financially boomers have some money say a college group that is concerned about climate change and if we were to bring to them these fascinating this this study you have made about young and the archetypes but what what would we bring to them from young that would be hopeful for them what do we bring to them that gives them something to feed on as opposed to it's it's all very dire do you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying what yeah, do we like bring it. to them to something because young is so fascinating but if they just say they'll be like a blah 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 if we yeah. don't bring them something to nourish them yep. thank you think think back to um greta Thun, 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 thunberg's uh statements how disappointed and abandon the youth field. And we have to start uh, addressing the, the young people by a deep analysis of what the problem is. If you don't go deep enough, the problems aren't gonna change. Um, so mm. what Jungians bring to the situation is I think the deepest possible analysis is why I got so excited about Jung as a scientist who was also interested in spirituality uh, back in my Berkeley days. Um, mm -hmm. And I saw Jung as a chance to bring all these things together. So mm -hmm. we have to establish a different archetypal foundational level in the Western psyche and across the planet. Mm -hmm. So I, I see Jungian psychology is a way that archetypally we can do that. One thing you hear now is that it's at the level of the mystics in every culture, that all humans mm -hmm. are connected. But yeah. Jung offers the opportunity, for example, if you talk about religion, and one of the things I'm working on next is uh, uh, looking at uh, is an integration of Christianity with Native American spirituality. To me, they, they feel like two kind of camps now. They both are incredibly valuable, but they don't quite mesh together for me. And that's what I'm working on. Um, but um, so 
And if you think of the spiritual dimension, this is where Jung disagreed with Freud. If you think of that's the most important fundamental aspect of being human, and all the religions are really vehicles to get us to that realm, but those vehicles are not alive for most people anymore. Jung said that's why you got to go back to the source uh, that, in, that inspired the Jesus and so on. But that's the source we talk about. So all that stuff I mentioned in a, in a K through 12 Jungian eco psychology program would be working with that source. Um, and and then, then you can say, uh, I've got the best dog in the world. And, and you can say, you've got the best dog in the world. And with this Jungian concept of the self, we can realize how we're both right. That depending on your culture and your historical mm -hmm. tradition, the way you access that realm and see it and the images for that are, are, mm -hmm. are going to be different, but it's the same. You got to establish that foundation first. And, and from that foundation, then you can critique things like corporations and the craziness in America right now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then especially for you, the idea of, like I say, we're, I'm flipping Jungian psychology on its head instead of second half of life. I started my search in the seventh mm -hmm. grade. My yeah. parents were not, uh, they didn't go to church. I didn't have a spiritual foundation. First thing I read mm -hmm. was science. I thought that would be the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, then I read uh, uh, Walden Pond and I thought, oh my God. And then I got into Christianity. So mm -hmm. that's when people start their search and that's when we can address it. And for, for me, the model is the vision quest. That's when you can get your uh, spirit animal or sacred landscape and that is a foundation and then you go out and do whatever if you're a, a political activism or growing a garden those are all specifics but we can't do these particulars and specifics if we don't have something deeper that's that's guiding us and forming us all along that's my premise mm -hmm. okay thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Arlo. Dennis, uh, you, if I hear you, you've made the transition from, in a way, being a scientist to much more of a spiritual individual. And if I hear your argument, you're really arguing that that's a, a process that we need to sort of follow, that there needs to be a deeper grounding, uh, which is really a kind of spiritual grounding. Is that, is that fair? Um, well, to, to be more specific, I honor my science side as from uh, uh, in, in, in kind of the embodiment of the spirit of Apollo. Uh, so it's just one of the gods. Uh, the, the, the self would be what kind of brings all the gods into relationship. But so I, I can call myself a, a spiritual scientist and, and I honor that dimension of Apollo, but I was fortunate that this high school science teacher was also in the Missouri Synod and he told us in the first few days of biology class that science has its parameters, it's limited, but the parameters are awfully powerful. I mean, I, I admire a good sports car, you know, so, uh, but it's, it's, it's the, the spiritual realm and it's the spiritual uh, dimension in the material realm and so on, a lot, much along the lines of the way Tyre de Chardin, de, de Chardin talked about the material realm. So the spirit in the land and, the, and the, uh, that's the spirit in the material. And that's what alchemy was about, was bringing together the material and the spiritual. So you've really positioned the Apollonian scientific within a much larger sort of framework. Exactly. Within the Greek pantheon, but then to see that as just part of our Western tradition, that's why I presented that before I did about the so much of the West has been influenced by the Christian tradition and the the myth around uh, Christianity. And one way I, I talk about that is um, myths are other people's religions. 
we have to realize that you know there's a mythic foundation of Christianity and a lot of myths got projected onto what I believe was a, a real human being. But then the unconscious uh, sense of ourself within it gets projected onto those figures out there that have tapped into the collective. So that's how you bring the, the interior intrapsychic into the collective at the, the, the spiritual level. Uh, it seems to me also that oftentimes now in the contemporary sort of scene that there's a there's a, a latching on to a spiritual mythological sort of perspective that tends to diminish science that has no place for science. Yes, I'm very sensitive to that as a scientist. Yeah. Yep. Very sensitive to that. I, in fact, I've had enough problems with the Jung Institute about science. And my first professional paper in the Boston Conference in 85 was called Jungian Psychology and Science, a Strained Relationship. So I've had a problem with Jungians, and I know other scientists that have had a problem with Jungians in the way they talk about science, including the great Marie Louise von Franz. So uh, that was, a, I also published an article, I've got to try to find it, I'm, I hope I didn't lose it from a floppy disk, uh, but I wrote that a long time ago. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about George Hoganson's work and complexity theory, because he's, he's applying those mathematical principles to basic Jungian concepts like the complex word association, the self and synchronicity very exciting for me as a scientist, because I always had problems from the beginning, and any biologist can have problems from the beginning. We talk about archetypes as images of instincts. You know, it takes them a while to, to explain that to somebody that it's not really that in a way, but um, complexity theory just is the Occam's razor. It's a much simpler and more basic way of talking about these basic Jungian concepts. Well, shall we go to the last part? So I have time to uh, uh, lay some more archetypal stuff on you and have some more questions and answers. Uh, we, we have one more. Debbie has her hand up. I just want to check with her and then we can move on. I don't want to take other people's time or your time, but um, I just wanted to say, give a reflection back that your, your ability to um, take all of the, the functions, thinking, feeling, sensate and intuition in your presentation is exquisite. And I, I, I'm wondering about um, your training in Zurich as being um, a lot of image work because you've incorporated a lot of images in this presentation. And finally, my comment was, um, I'm very excited about your reflection on taking photographs and, and using those as a way to do active imagination. Oh yeah, I got that. I, I've, I've been blessed with, with so many good teachers in my life and uh, Gordon Tappan uh, was my uh, advisor. And when I was working on my degree in humanistic psychology at Sonoma State and uh, we, we were both admirers of James, James Hillman uh, Susan Boulay, that, that painter I talked about, and uh, Li Ching. And in a dream workshop, one thing that uh, uh, Tappan did is he put pictures of many of Susan Boulay's paintings around, and we were to look at them to help to get into that imaginal space before we work with our dream. And that's one of the th things I've always felt about my Zurich training. It was heavy, heavy emphasis on the symbolic and the imaginal realm, which is really why I got into Jungian psychology. And the only reason I'm a therapist is because of Jung. I never thought of being a therapist growing up, but when I discovered Jung, it's just like, wow, there is a worldview there that can integrate just about everything. And I, 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 I'm, I'm presenting it as a worldview for the future, for the environment. So having said that, let's get back to, um, um, here we are. Oh boy, I always get a little anxious when I gotta do something with a technological switch here. And where was I? 
All right. So I just want to talk about some phenomenal books that I would use in this K through 12. And this is a rare book. I talked to one of the Renaissance men at Madison. He said there are very few books like this. The Passion of the Western Mind by Tarnas. I know Tarnas has written a complimentary book on astrology, but it's one of the few books, reads like a novel, starting with Western history, but the pre-Socratics, and somebody who understands Jung. Whoops, not screen sharing. Thank you for telling me to play. Hmm. So I you might have to hit the actual play, like the play. Yeah, I tried to hit it. Icon. But, uh, yeah, yeah you, the word play is not active. It's just yeah. Your 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 message to me was in, impeding my ability to hit that um, play. Okay, this is the book. Um, and uh, it, it, for somebody with a science background, it really helped uh, fill in my humanistic background, if you will. This is, a, I think, another excellent book for academics, Rethinking Nature. Uh, I have a chapter in there on eco-psychology, but, oh, I was going to get the book, hang on. So nice to have your office in your in your library. Uh, this was put out to uh, for academics and how they're going to have to reorganize academics to deal academia to deal with the environment. And here are some of the chapters: environmental ethics, uh, eco e ecosophy. I think that's philosophy and ecology, eco spirituality. My chapter. The aesthetics of nature, eco criticism, epistemology, and so on. There are 21 chapters. Nature's Metropolis. If you're in the Midwest, you've got to read this book. It, it, it uh, explains how Chicago is the yang to the Midwest yin of uh, the incredible agricultural resources and the forest and so on. Um, written by William Cronin. This is his PhD thesis at Yale. We grew up in Madison. And it describes how Chicago became a Jungian in terms of the young. They developed McCormick Deering, the farm equipment to be able to uh, harvest this, uh, this, some of the best agricultural soil in the world, the bread basket, the corn belt, and so on. Um, the, uh, Slaughterhouses, the, all the cattle were sent into uh, Chicago and so on. It's, it's just a wonderful book. It was so good that uh, I didn't hate the Chicago Bears so much anymore after I read it. Here's a good book about different spiritual practices uh, that you can use as therapist. Uh, and he recommends like where to go, all types of environments you want to be in for depression or anxiety and so on. And this is... Um, the second part of what I have to offer, when I talked about the corporation being the modern day monster. And this is one of many good books out there about uh, sustainable or green economy. And these are some of the premises. Now they're thinking big, but like I said, we've got to think big. We've got to think in terms of paradigm shifts. So these people, and they, they lay out the premises in this book, Enough is Enough, are talking about wealth redistribution on a planetary level, decreasing hours by almost half, thus allowing time for workers to spend valuable hours with family, friends, hobbies, community building, and so on. Jung said he was in, an inspiration for Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, you can't just tell people to stop doing something that they're addicted to. You have to have something equally powerful to replace them in positive. And I'm thinking that this is what we can offer people instead of trying to buy themselves into happiness or drink themselves or smoke themselves into it. Um, uh, uh, issues about the family and being able to cultivate friends, hobbies, connection with nature, like at these nature centers and so on but you have to cut down on the, the working hours to begin with. Spreading the work hours around the planet, I mentioned that. This is right up Young's Alley, limiting population numbers. 
you know, as an environmentalist, uh, 30 years ago, I was, I was looking at the population increase around the world. What do you know, Central America, all these population explosions. Um, and what do we have now? So one of the reasons between that and the climate change and the effect on the coffee groves and plantations in Guatemala, all these immigrants coming across the border, we have to consciously limit our number. The idea is, Jung talked about uh, the alchemical idea of the opus contra naturum, the work against nature. We have to work against our natural nature as an animal to reproduce. We have to consciously limit our numbers. Uh, we have to work against our natural nature to extend our power. That power gets um, uh, solidified and legalized in the forms of the laws supporting the corporate model. Work against nature, I think, is to, to, uh, to uh, not to destroy it, but to modify it. And there are different types of corporations. I think there are B corporations. There are ways of doing it. It's going to take a lot of work, but we have to have this kind of spiritual, psychological foundation uh, for us to do one of the many things, uh, like addressing corporate power. So now I'm going to provide an uh, archetypal framework for uh, moving forward. My, one of my main symbol systems is the I Ching. Um, when I discovered Jung, and I, because his name kept popping up in such diverse and interesting ways in my Berkeley days, I thought, who in the heck is this guy? And then in 1973, San Francisco Jung Institute put on an introduction to Jung. They showed Vanderpost and face to face. Um, and then that fall, I took my first course and just really got taken by Jung. And when I started reading Jung, he kept mentioning this I Ching. What the heck is that? And they, uh, this is very Unitarian, very Berkeley. Uh, the Unitarian Society in Berkeley to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Jung's birth put on a week-long series of events to do that. And the last event was a Yi Jing workshop taught by a Presbyterian minister who had given up his church in Oregon to come down and work with street people in Berkeley. And one of the things he did with them was to cast a hexagram. Um, so uh, I've never used coins. I had a countercultural friend, shall we say, that sold, sold yarrow stocks as a way of consulting the Jing. And I took to the Jing like I did to Jung. It's like, where has this book been all my life? I can't believe that everybody doesn't use it. So it's 64 hexagrams. They are archetypes based on the binary code. So it's a numeric base, which Jung said was the purest form of the archetypes. I go into all this in my talk on uh, Orange County Jung Society on the I Ching. Uh, so these solid and broken yin and yang lines are the first attempt by the Chinese to get some sense of what that pure form of the archetype, the binary system means. So this is a hexagram called increase. And I'm positing that as an archetypal guide for us at this moment. And it is an evolution of the hexagram 12 standstill. So those, those three top lines are yang lines. And yang is associated with the, like the archetypal masculine, with uh, intellect, with thinking, with the spirit, and with heaven. And their natural movement is up. Those three lower lines are three yin lines. That's archetypally associated with the feminine, with the receptive, with the dark, the moist, and the earth. Its natural movement is down. So heaven and earth are out of relationship with each other. This is a very negative situation for the Chinese. Uh, the, the I Ching is known as the book of changes. So standstill is one of the most negative situations. Now here's what has happened. The Chinese see on the left that lower of those upper three lines has come down there to the hexagram on the right, 42, to help out those three yin lines. And that to the Chinese is increase. And this is what Wilhelm, which is one of the, still one of the best translations of the Jing, 
Um, and I, I always start with it when I work with it. And by the way, I do have, there's a talk I gave at the Chicago Jung Institute on uh, hexagrams appearing in the dreams of a Western man, where I explain some of this. And also I have a, a uh, online YouTube of uh, how to consult the aging with the Arrow stock method. So the message from hexagram 42 right out of Wilhelm is that the, uh, the hexagram, which is an archetypal image, Jung said the hexagrams are all archetypal images. There are 4,096 4, archetypal images, combinations of yin and yang lines, is that power in whatever form comes down to help the less fortunate. Power in whatever form comes down to help the less fortunate. And Wilhelm said this about Baines, who uh, translated the German Wilhelm into English. She was the wife of a British psychoanalyst. And it says, this conception expresses the fundamental idea on which the Book of Changes is based. To rule truly is to serve. A sacrifice of the higher element that produces an increase of the lower is called an out and out increase. It indicates the spirit that alone has power to help the world. It indicates the spirit that alone has power to help the world. So archetypally, how is this expressed? If that's the disco ball, hexagram 42 increase, it is shown in how we address income inequality, racism, sexism, political and social inequalities, and healthcare inequalities. Think America. A major inequality is our species in relationship to all other species. We must realize, as I said before, how unique we are in being able to figure out the laws of nature and bend them to our affect, to our benefit. That's Hermes and the Apollo. Hermes is advertising, Apollo is science. Saturn as the forms uh, for the corporations and so on to produce all this material stuff. If we control diseases, a natural limiting factor, we must consciously limit our human populations. Religions that don't support that have to change. And then uh, this is kind of a summary here. So in this presentation, I have focused on the unique copper uh, contributions, un unique dimensions of Jungian psychology uh, that brings uh, to us a deep understanding of our dysfunctional relationship with the environment and how we can work in a Jungian manner to connect more pe people more deeply to nature. Nature offers ecological models of interrelatedness and interconnectedness that we must apply to our human systems and relationships, beginning at the intrapsychic level with the uh, relationship to the little people within. We can bring into our therapeutic practice an ecological construct of the psyche at many levels. And there's a chapter in my Jung and Eco Psychology, Volume 1, on uh, these principles uh, in psychotherapy. The sense of a transcendent and archetypal dimension is most significant when we can recognize what indigenous cultures call spirit animals, what can be seen as the essence of a person, a foundation for their life, and a guiding and healing spirit, a self-image in Jungian terms. So to summarize then, Jung's new age paradigm shift, we must think big and in comprehensive terms, we must be thinking in terms of a paradigm shift. We have to change the corporate model. Otherwise, uh, it'll be like trying to change the course of the Titanic. These are not small tasks, but we have to th think back to the beginning of my talk. We have to realize how terrible the situation is. We have to realize how frightening the future is for our children to compel us to work toward major change and major shifts in what we're doing. Um, and then always keep in mind that transitions are chaotic and often dangerous. Think of the French Revolution. That's one way I think of living in the upper Midwest. All these white blue collar workers that lost their jobs, they're never gonna come back. 
somebody comes along as a savior promising to make America great again and restore all this stuff. Um, and and that, that, that leads people to follow a false prophet. As far as I, this is my personal experience, um, uh, opinion, one Jungian's opinion. It's not the opinion of the Jung Institute, okay? Um, so, uh, and that's one thing I like about living in Milwaukee. We fell the hardest and the fastest. And we had one of the, the best public health care systems in the country. We had socialist mayors for decades, unlike any other American city. And look where we are now, some of the highest poverty rates, um, poorest health care for African Americans, on and on and on. So one of my images uh, is from Tyre de Chardin. He talked about our human species evolving toward an omega point, like a universal consciousness. And I say that these utopian ideas have to be reality. We have to think in terms of a brotherhood and sisterhood of man. We are all in this together, economically, and in terms of our uh, uh, systems, all the systems that we have established and so on. It's not a Chinese problem. An American problem is a species problem in how we look at each other, but in, we can get a sense of, of how out of balance we are by looking at how out of balance we are in nature. And that degree of imbalance with nature, because like I said, of our uniqueness as a species, is pretty much being shown in how unbalanced we are with each other. And, and things are just getting worse. You look at the um, authoritarian governments in Poland, in Brazil, and so on, and the environment as uh, catastrophes, as, as um, uh, conflict amplifiers, as the uh, military says. And what is disturbing to me as a scientist is that twice now I know that um, I've heard of the uh, environmentalists making predictions about climate change, and they always make the worst case scenario in their predictions. And then when the, they looked at further data, the data was worse than their worst case scenarios. And they can't believe what's happening with the fires on the West Coast and so on. It's happening faster than they can imagine. This is really disturbing. So in closing then, uh, there's my plug, like Arlo, said I have articles on guns in the American psyche. I think it's a pretty good one. It's been published in the uh, Anthropology of Consciousness Journal. Uh, Jungian perspective on climate change, COVID-19. Uh, that was just uh, published in the Journal of Analytical Psychology. And I found out that my article on uh, Jung and the Environment is coming out in the special edition of the Journal of Analytical Psychology on the Environment and Climate Change. There's my blog, Eco Young, on my website, ecoyoung.com. And um, I still haven't retrieved a lot of stuff on there. If you want to email about me about some of these things, you can. Uh, if I put out a, uh, was a student video many years ago called Seasons of the Soul, where I illustrate the uh, mythic and imaginal dimensions of weather and seasons here in the upper Midwest. Uh, based on things like the Native American medicine wheel, uh, uh, American uh, holidays and traditions, uh, Christian festivals and cele celebrations, and the I Ching. It's, uh, there are a lot of copyright images on there, so I can use it for educational purposes. So if you email me, I can give you the link and the password. And if you're interested in this uh, material about complexity theory and so on, I have a PDF called Sacred Landscapes, Sacred Seasons, a Jungian Eco-Psychological Perspective. It's pretty dense, but I can mail you the uh, a PDF of that. So, ta-da, thank you. We still have some time for questions. Um, yes, thank you so much, Dennis. Um... Yeah, we can take a, a few minutes here. If anybody has any questions, please use the raise hand button and I will call on you to ask your question.
while they're doing that, I'm going to go get a, another drink of water. All right. Uh, let's see here. Sundance. I just, there you go. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm just going to wait uh, for Dennis to get his drink of water. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm looking at that animal on his shelf. I can't quite tell what that is. Uh, yeah, what's, what's over your shoulder here? Yeah. <laughs> okay, badge. I'm in the badger state. Awesome, Great, wonderful. Yeah, I, I was just, uh, first of all, thank you very much. I feel like this presentation is so important and timely and um, it's, it's connected with a lot of the stuff I do also. So I, I really just really appreciate you bringing this, um, this message. Well, thank um, you. What I wanted to ask though was, and I'm not an analyst or anything, but just from a a, you know, an echo psychologist point of view is how, how do you, do you work with your patients or your clients and say, look at them in terms of their relationship with their land or, you know, their, their relationship with the environment is, is that part of your analytic practice to, to work with them on those kind of issues? Or is it more just, if it comes up, it comes up and, and you talk about it with them. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, my forte has always been dream work. Mm. I always look for what is a potential spirit animal or a connection to the land. And then I just, uh, then I, I give them the spiel pretty much I, as I gave you. It's like I talk about how the Lakota Sioux deal with it and then how you have to manifest that spirit animal in your life. Yeah. And I gave examples of how I, I, I am doing that with my uh sacred Wisconsin meadow scene. Um, and also, I pretty much lay it out. Uh, I, I talk about the paradigm shift and what a mess we're in and, and, and at, at, at such deep levels, what um, a mess we're in and so on. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, I, uh, I work with a lot of men. I had a, several young men came into my practice because of Jordan Peterson, he kind of was popularized um, you know, Jungian psychology in ways that um, many analysts don't agree with, but it has brought several men into um, Jungian analysis. Um, and uh, uh, I talk very much in this archetypal manner with, with um, just about everybody. Uh, you know, for some people that's too abstract, it's, it's too far away. They're so kind of tied up in their, their personal image or trauma stuff. But any opportunity I get, and and quite frankly, to um, go off on a tangent a bit, uh, doing something like this lecture and working with my clients, I've spent all those years developing. It took me 18 years because I'm, uh, you know, you, you got a practice going, you got three kids and so on. It took me 18 years to write the Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe. But what I like now is I'm, I'm finding different ways of applying these these concepts. To my work and because I work so much with Hermes sometimes I talk a little bit too much about Hermes as being the god of transitional places and dreams. Thank you but so much. I That's also really like helpful. That in, in my volume one I think about about eight pages about um, how you apply these uh, concepts in psychotherapy. That's just a Jungian perspective that uh, uh, at this archetypal symbolic level. Uh, uh, the other psychologies and ecotherapists, they've done all these other things, the particular practices and what you can meditate on and, and so on and so on. That's all complementary to my work. But like I said, Jungian contribution is what we can make at this very fundamental archetypal and symbolic level. That's our most important contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have Michael. Uh, thanks, Danielle. And thank you, Dennis, for this uh, wonderful presentation with so many layers and, and so many directions to, to pursue. It's been uh, really cool. Um, my, my question, I wonder if you could speak a little more to the, the psychological uh, situation of like, I'm thinking about people who move from one landscape to another. You, you spoke about topophilia and you know place rootedness and 
I, like you, I'm, a, I'm an upper Midwesterner and I now live in California, uh, an hour away from Berkeley. Um, and I haven't, made, I haven't made the return home yet. And I'm like, the seasons are so different. The land is so different here. Mm -hmm. And I, I wondered if you could maybe just kind of speak to that a little more in the, what that means for the, the, the self and the psyche. Oh, thank you so much for that question. You, you guys are beginning to feel like plants. Um, I mean, planted question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I got two parts here. I was actually born in, uh, I was actually born in Long Beach, California. My mother went out from the home dairy farm around Green Bay to hang on the sunlight's coming in here pretty strong again. I just love noticing the change of the sunlight and so on. Still a problem. There we go. Um, and, and she was, uh, she got a job with Douglas Aircraft building those flying fortresses, uh, the bombers. And then after my dad got back from France in the war, my first six years of my life were in Anaheim. And that was when we were surrounded by orange groves. And my parents thought the city is no place to raise kids. So they moved back to the farm, that dairy farm I showed when I was six. And it was a culture shock. Same one room country school my mother went to with the same teacher, all these farm kids. And it uh, took me a while to realize why they had a fingernail check in the morning because one guy always came right out of the barn. He smelled just like cow manure. So, and then all these Belgians spoke so funny. D's and them and does. Um, my uh, part of Kiwani County is mostly Czech, but we had a, a, a Door County is, uh, uh, this is here, that's mostly a lot of Belgians here. Uh, so it was culture shock. And for years, I wanted to go back to California. Finally, I decided about the eighth grade, well, maybe California, maybe Wisconsin's as good as California. So I get out to Berkeley, California girlfriend, travel all over, see all these fabulous places. And then I met, a, after being out there, this was about 72, got together with a woman who had a lot of girlfriends and I had a lot of uh, entomology male friends and we had spike punches and my all my tapes from the music from the fraternity. So I had these great parties and she had a party with, uh, she was in law school and Henry Royce's son, Henry Royce set up the Ice Age Trail here in Wisconsin, was at the party. He was in law school. I'm talking to him for a while. And he says, you miss Wisconsin, don't you? And that was a shock to me. And I thought about it and I realized I felt more connected with the land and the seasons and the smells here and the weather than I ever felt in, in California. And then when I had that dream in Switzerland about the sacred landscape, uh, you know, this is flyover country. It's not flashy. There's no Dreadwoods. There's no Yosemite Valley. You know, there's no San Francisco Bay Bridge um, or the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but there's, you, you have to study the land. You have to know something about it. You have to know about drumlins. Uh, Phil Lewis said there are 72 personalities here in Wisconsin. There are six in Illinois. There's just, but you have to be uh, conscious of what you're looking at. And these are the types of things. So that was the first response to your question. And yes, uh, another issue becomes uh, where can your where is your can you where can you live that your soul feels most supported and can help you feel interconnected with the environment at a deep level? I think of a dear friend of mine who was is a mountain girl, and here she was in Wisconsin, and her husband grew up in Texas, but he loved the water. So when they retired. Uh, he had some family money from some oil wells in Texas. He bought a small yacht and, and they sailed around for years in the Gulf of California, Baja, California. Then he died. So now she's back in the mountains. So there, there may be places where it, it would be ideal for your psyche to live, for you to be fully human. The other question I think is more interesting that you raise how do you help people 
like Americans that move around a lot. And that is what I've worked on in the, the, uh, the book Land, Weather, Seasons, Insects. You take these archetypal concepts and you apply them to whatever you're in. Uh, another thing that I've done, and I may get back to it, but 25 years ago, I thought of an ultimate eco-psychology program for the state of Wisconsin. And I presented it to the uh, um, UW, that uh, the, the, the branch of the university that goes after grant money. And they said, this, uh, we can get support for this because it's multicultural, interdisciplinary. But I'm not a card carrying member of UW. We could not get a science department to back us. But I know I had a good idea because one of the scientists tried to rip it off, tried to put it, put it in under his name, but he cut out the Jungian psychology part of Native American spirituality. So my wife was able to embarrass the guy and get it withdrawn. But I do have ideas of how you can develop a program so that when people move into an area, they have a, a, a program that can help them connect to the land. And I've been able to experience that myself, moving here to Milwaukee 13 years ago after living for 25 years in Madison, came back from Zurich, settled in Madison. So I've been watching myself how I get connected to Milwaukee, not only the culture and the history here, but also to the land. So I, I'm kind of a, a case study of myself. I think these are very important issues and I, I see this as part of eco-psychology. So those are the three parts I, I tried to answer your question. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dennis. I, I appreciate your time. So thank you, Dennis. Appreciate uh, your sharing all of your years of uh, research and work and wisdom with us today. It's been a, a wonderful sort of journey for three hours.